kind of what I thought I would do yesterday was I wanted to kind of get like um, an overview of the track from the perspective of how I would probably end up mixing it, um, which means I would probably start with the drum and the bass first. And to my, you know, kind of general impression about, you know, any kind of heavy music or anything that's supposed to groove or make your ass shake, you want the kick drum and the bass to be kind of like one thing. And you want it to just make you like want to groove just without listening to anything else. No guitars, no nothing else. Just ass kicking beats. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show a little bit of the drums and the percussion stuff that's going on here. Yeah, really f incredible. 808. Why not? Still sounds good. I probably wouldn't change too much about it today, even if I was to redo it, but that's because I've actually kind of had a, you know, kind of a little, little, little thing, you know, that I used to do. Um, and I still do it just the way that I mix. It hasn't really changed that much. So yeah, um, just for first off, like it's just battery four. just these little, it's DMT kit. <laughs> yeah, it's a, Oh my god, I didn't realize that sample was in there. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, cool. Yeah, so anyway, that's the 808 thing that was going on at the beginning. So anyway, yeah, it's... Uh, I think I actually might have started this song originally with just like the opening sense, because sometimes I do that. I'll do some shit like this. And be like, okay, that's the vibe. So that's a cool one, right? And that is uh, Native Instruments FM8. It's probably also a preset that I also f with. Just, you know, I, I like to, like, if you're moving fast, you find something you really like and then you f it up. Just go and f up some shit so it sounds better. Or just make it your own. It doesn't matter if it sounds better or not. Just make sure it doesn't sound like everybody else and it doesn't sound like a <laughs> preset. Because everybody ends up using the same goddamn presets on stuff and it sucks. And this is also, this is massive. I was using a lot of native instruments back then. I really don't use massive anymore. I never reach for it. But that's a really cool sound. Sounds like the X-Files, one of my friends told me. He's a big X-Files fan, so maybe he's biased, but pff, whatever, man. He's not wrong. And then scapes. Oh, yeah, God, man. I was, I was really into native instruments at one point. And that's a really cool sound. That's absinthe. Ooh. Yes, I've got Serum, and I've got, like, the Arteria V collection, and all kinds of shit. I have too much shit, but... That's fucking epic, man. It really, if you know how to program sense, it really doesn't matter what you use, because... No matter what you're doing, you'll always kind of end up at the same general destination if you're trying to program a pad or a evolving thing or like an arpeggio or whatever. Sometimes I think maybe I should just make a fucking like synth sleep album or something. So I wanted to do something that was different. I wanted to kind of like immediately kind of just hit people in the fucking face. So the very first track on the record is... So, let's take a look at some of these drums. All right, and I'm used to using two monitors, so right now it's going to be a struggle for me switching back and forth between these guys. Um, for whatever reason, <laughs> I, just, I usually have both of these windows open at the same time. 
So here I've got the overheads coming out of Steven Slate, and I should probably show you the Steven Slate stuff, huh? Um, and it's, I think it's an older version of Slate, because I'm using SSD 5 now, and this is probably SSD 4, so hopefully it's... Uh, yeah, I have no idea what drum kit that is, that is here, because I don't think the old version even showed you what kit was loaded, but it's probably my user Infinity Slave kit. Um, I'm gonna go off on a, uh, go out on a limb and say that's probably what it is, so. What's going on with this guy is I actually have all of the drums sent out to different outputs. And these outputs are shown right here in, um, in Cubase. So you have to use the outputs within the synth, uh, within the, uh, the plugin itself, and then you have to actually, uh, turn on the, the outputs individually from within Cubase so that they actually show up on tracks. And when you do that, you get all of these right here. So you'll get like your, your first MIDI track, which is going to be whatever the name of the, the main, uh, instance of SSD four is, and then it's going to have all these like kind of breakout tracks like this. So it'll actually show up on your mixer view as individual tracks. So you can have your kick drum, solo it, it your overheads, percussion, whatever is going on. I'm not sure exactly how I did all of that. So, so here's the overheads. Those get their own stereo track because overheads should be stereo. And, uh, looks like the first thing I did back in 2016, 17, 18, whatever, let's say 2018. Let's say that I was still tweaking in 2018, so the final decisions probably were made then. But it looks like I rolled off a little bit of the extreme highs. Um, not extreme highs, but maybe around like 7K, yeah, 7.5K. Looks like I, I bumped and, and carved out a little bit of sound here. Overheads sound pretty decent, but they're a little dull and fat, so I, th I think I thinned them out a little bit. A little bit of compression. I typically don't really smash my overheads too much, but what I do smash are my rooms. You can hear how fucking destroyed that room track is. So yeah, same thing. A little bit of um, EQing going in to take away some of the fatness. I find that this kind of makes a little more room for everything else. And then um, just compressing the dog shit out of it. So it actually does sound more like a room, but then you turn on the compressor and it sounds like just, it sounds like uh, one of those weird parts of like, you know, the end of Piggy by Nine Inch Nails or something. That's kind of what I think of when I, when I think of like rooms uh, and, you know, doing like any production on drums like that. Rooms sound crushed. Sounds like, a, it should sound like a Nine Inch Nails album, like where they do that kind of stuff. Kick drum. Oh my God. It's probably the same kick drum that every fucking metal band uses now uh, on all their records. All the degent bands, um, which, to be fair, like everything's starting to sound like this now, and I'm just kind of like fucking over it. So a lot of my newer shit's gonna sound a little bit different. Um, but let's see here. That kick drum by itself, it's a good sample, but it's really thuddy, and I wanted something more metal with like a higher attack. Wanted to smack a little more. So after. EQing and a really tight compressor. That compressor is keeping it right at like, you know, minus three, like, like three decibels of gain reduction. Um, keeping it pretty tight and then a little, a little more EQ after that. I tend to find that like whatever you EQ into the compressor is what the compressor is going to trigger off of and sometimes it needs a little help after the fact. So even though I'm boosting the highs, the compressor actually still favors the low end information as the trigger for the compressor. And um, I wanted to add some more brightness and some punch to it later. And it looks like I took out a little bit of like low mids too, just to give it a little more of a scooped kind of sound. But that's gonna drive you nuts, isn't it? Ha ha ha. So here we go, snare drum. I know the snare drum in this thing, like a lot of people were asking me what I did because it sounds so fucking snappy. Yeah, it's not. A, it's a really good sounding snare, but it's not quite fucking slapping the way I want it to and it doesn't have a lot of body that I want But that's that's okay because the information's in there. We just gotta push it out with the um, With the EQ and the compression. So now 
I'm boosting a bunch of lows in the snare drum, boosting some highs, boosting some presents, cutting some mud out of the low mids, and then slamming that thing through the, uh, the blue, I guess it's the modern 1176 module here in the Stephen Slate VMR. Um, I really like the Slate VMR. These days I'm using the Oxford SSL plugins and a lot of the bra uh, Brainworks stuff. Um, but this is pretty much... This is pretty much it right here. Um, I was I was just really into Stephen Slate. I used it across the entire album so I could get a more consistent sound. I really learned how to love this, uh, this suite. And also every channel has the VCC virtual channel. So everything kind of has like a, a little more of like a console bleed kind of thing going on to it. So uh, here, let me find some toms that are actually in here. I'm a big fan of toms. I love toms. I don't want my toms to sound small. Yeah, and they sound pretty good, so... Everything should kind of punch out. Like, your toms should be big, your snare should be big, kick should be big, everything should sound good. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, putting something in a mix and then covering it up. It, everything should have a place. So there we go. That's kind of the drum, main sound of the drums there. Uh, so I guess moving on to the bass. Yes, in the, the panning. Yeah, you have to pan your toms. Um, I don't think I did any sort of hard panning. Let's take a look. Uh, I will highlight just the toms. Uh, tom 1, 2, 3, and floor tom. I guess that was the way I want. Yeah, so uh, none of them are super hard panned it's like 66 40 but it's still kind of think about being a drummer and you're sitting at the kit think about where your drums would be in front of you and that's kind of my rule for how i would mix i do mix from a drummer's perspective because when i write drum parts i think i try to think like a drummer would um even though i'm not a drummer i i'm, I'm imagining what if i could make my body do the things that i can hear in my head um so there um and then it's uh, nothing too special going on uh, past this point, really, because I think we just have a hi-hat. There's a little velocity going on in that hi-hat, so it just doesn't sound like completely hard out. But like I did program a lot of this fucking album to just be like in your fucking face and not a lot of velocity for the really in your face parts. Uh, but other parts, I would go back in and really put that time in to get it super duper realistic. But um, once you get all these drums put together, very mechanical, very programmed. I don't give a fuck um, because I didn't have a real drum kit. But if you're not going to use a real drum kit, that's about as good as you're going to get. And... I, you know, you could still, you know, mix it like it's a real kit. You could still fuck it up if you want to, but that's the choice. But yeah, I have on the kick drum, I have a send, which is uh, side chaining a compressor that is connected here to the bass. So you can actually see that's every time the kick drum hits. And it's, uh, it's actually sucking the bass out. That's when you can feel it. Oh yeah. Yeah, for the bass, I was just using dirty old nasty guitar rig. But I used a copy, so I recorded it onto two separate tracks at the same time. So one of them is this nice, nice round bassy sound. Some EQing and compression after going on. There's a brick wall limiter, not really sure why, but I guess I wanted to squash the top end just a little more. 
I'm a little more aggressive with my production stuff these days than I was back then. There was a lot of figuring things out, I think, still going on. Uh, but if you do a couple of video game soundtracks and shit, you've, uh, you've lived with your DAW for like months, you know, you really start to find the quickest ways to do things. So it's no question. I probably was a little better at it by now. Um, the second bass sound is just this fucking gnarly ass distorted. I think it's uh, got a metal zone in there. Just a metal zone module. I was playing with the screamer, like a tube screamer kind of thing, but I actually went with the metal zone into the bass pro, so... Uh, that's basically like a metal zone feeding into a VST, uh, 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 SVT, sorry, SVT, like an MPEG, a VST. Pretty aggressive, um, filtering going on low end there, so I want the clean bass to kind of be my low end information. That is going to sit a little nicer sit a little nicer. Yeah. So it's just going to hold that low end so that the low end of the kick and the low end of that bass are really kind of talking to each other. So yeah, um, the, the general rule of thumb is you want to have a clean bass sound that, you know, you want your low end of the bass to be clean and you want it to be pretty compressed. You want it to feel like it's one thing with the kick drum. So this guy is going to be clean, it's going to be low, it's going to be compressed. Um, the other bass, the distorted bass, uh, is like I said, it's just a copy. I recorded a DI into it and then just copied it over and then put different plugins on each one. So the second distorted one uh, has a big high pass filter on it, probably around like 100 hertz or something. So everything below 100 hertz is getting rolled off on that bass. So you've got one that occupies the low end information. You've got one that occupies like the mids and mid highs kind of bridges the gap between the guitars. So that way you have full control over everything. Because once you start distorting stuff, sometimes you lose the solidity of that bass punch. And I did it this way back then because I didn't have something like parallax, which neural DSP parallax will allow you to actually um, within the same plugin have these these uh, multi band distortions and stuff. It's really simple. But it sounds really fucking good, and it's a lot easier than what I was doing back then. But that is the way I did it across uh, the whole damn album. So that's why, if we listen back to it one more time before we move on to the next thing, we got the bass and the drums, and they just sound fucking awesome together. And in some of these cases, I did do some hard editing um, across the bass. Yeah, I can see how those cuts are in there. And all I did was when I played uh, the track, I just went back in and any place where my hands actually were muting, I just actually cut it because my hands were muting it properly and it sounded really fucking good um, because I am a really tight player on bass and guitar. I'm a really fucking tight rhythm player. A lot of people ask me like, how do I edit my guitars and stuff? I really don't look at these chunks, man. Like that's entire like eight, you know, uh, that's like four bars, you know, like a, a, of stuff. And then it's just only in these really tight sections. Do I just tighten it up a little more? Because like in production, sometimes like that little bit of unnatural chopping sounds really good on record live. No one would fucking notice how tight you actually play it. As long as you're generally playing it like that, it's, it's good. Um, so that one, let's see. Uh, oh, there's another thing too, is when you have these double tracks like that, sometimes you might want to use only one or the other. So in this case, I only use the distorted bass track, um, for this little break. And maybe I didn't want the low end to be so powerful. I wanted it to be more powerful when it kicked in. So here we go. Hey, uh, I just noticed a bunch of people just joined us. Uh, thank you for joining and, uh, Welcome. We're looking over uh, Infinity Slave. I don't think I even said it in the beginning. This is Infinity Slave by Epsilon Zero. This is the first song on my uh, 2018 Epsilon Zero album, Requiem. 
Uh, so here we go. Um, yeah, and it just gets a little fatter, a little fuller by the time it comes through there because I didn't want it to be full. Uh, I want it to, to kind of kind of step back. And it just makes that uh, reintro a hit just a little fucking harder because that low end isn't there. And then all of a sudden, boom, like the drums and then the nice fat, clean low bass kicks in and just that little kind of thinner, high passed, uh, dirty bass just, you know, like it, it, it provides what I needed from it, but uh, it allowed me to kind of step the power back a bit. What's up, Ben? Finally got this shit working, man. <clears throat> so I just got done going through all of the the drums and the bass stuff, but this will all be uh, up on Twitch when I'm done with it. So cool. All right, so that's the bass production and the uh, drum production. There's not a lot of like secrets to it, man. I honestly really like to keep things simple. If you look at this session from top to bottom. That's, there's not a lot of like layerings. There's not a lot of tracks. There's not a ton of synths. There's not a ton of guitars. There's two lead, uh, two rhythm guitars and like two different rhythm sounds. And one of them is just like a harmony. So there's only, there's five guitar tracks. And then there's like a set of tracks that, that I like maybe didn't like the tone and went back and re-recorded it. So that being said, uh, let's move on from the drums. Oh, uh, before I move on from the drums here, I'll take a look at one little thing here. The drums do go through a group and let's see what I was using as a group back then. It looks like I was using, uh, Magneto. Okay. That's a Steinberg stock plugin that I haven't seen probably since I actually used it on this album. Cause I'm like not familiar <laughs> at all but probably because i have the slate virtual tape machines now so if i want to do anything to give it more of a tape vibe there you go so i i guess i wanted it to sound like the drums were recorded uh and then tracked to maybe like um you know two inch tape maybe before they were all flown into the rest of the session you know i sometimes i think about things like the way they would have happened in real life in the real world back when we used to like actually use tape and stuff and yeah i'm old enough and young enough that um, I was I was there. I I had to do some of that work back then. I get to talking too much. I need to make sure I drink, drink my freaking tea, man. All right. So at the end of the drum bus, it looks like I started with a Stephen Slate preset drum bus polish, and uh, again. Try presets. See if it makes an improvement over your sound immediately. Um, sometimes it'll get you so close, you'll just have to tweak maybe a couple of things. Because whatever uh, Steven Slate used or whoever made that plug-in preset, whatever they were mixing probably sounded a little different than what I'm using uh, going in. So I've got to actually change it around to make it work. So it looks like uh, basically what I just did was just completely fucking an annihilate something there. Uh, let's see. There we go. I just fucking accidentally deleted a, a module, but it does it. Look, it's got an undo and a redo button. <sighs> Save my ass just now. That's never happened. Uh, so yeah, it looks like there's a little bit of a high end boost, uh, just going into it. Just a little bit of high end up there on the FGN. Uh, and then I've got the drums slamming through this compressor but if you look at the mix knob i'm actually only mixing in 18 percent of the compressed signal so that's parallel drums um if i didn't do it that way it would just be slammed to death like that that's not it sounds cool but it's not good in a mix it's way too crushed Eighteen percent. There we go. And then it looks like here. Wow, that made a nice difference. On rather. So this is this is the revival Stephen Slate plug-in, and this just just has like a little bit of a kind of a harmonic boost. 
So it's adding a little bit of kind of upper harmonics that just kind of smooths out the top end of the whole drum kit. Um, this is the whole drum bus, by the way. So this is what everything is going through. I mix the drums first so they sound good on their own. Then I send them to this stereo bus and then start doing this tweaking. It looks like I'm also adding a little low end harmonics on the thickness knob. Can I get a witness? I need a little thickness. Yeah. And then it's going through the virtual channel. Nice. I wouldn't do anything too incredibly different today. I might be using, like I said, Brainworks uh, plugins from Plugin Alliance, or maybe I would be using, I don't know, fucking, uh, the Oxford SSL. I think I have found other plugins that I like a little better um, than, you know, some of the other stuff, like just using Slate all the time uh, didn't really keep me happy all the time, I guess is the way I'm saying it. But like, if you can't, if you can't get good results out of Steven Slate VMR, then just like, forget it. Um, it's amazing. And you can also get all the other, you know, you should be able to get a decent mix with any stock plugins from any DAW these days. I don't really give a shit who you are. If you don't, if you, if your stuff doesn't sound good, it's because you don't know what you're doing yet. And that's fine. Um, you know, YouTube, uh, come see me, whatever. I mean, I'm not the, the, the expert mix guy in the world. You know, I'm not Joey Sturgis or whatever, but I get around. So. The next thing we're going to check out is the guitars. And this is cool because uh, a lot of people use guitar synth, uh, guitar um, uh, simulator plugins these days. But for this album, I actually wanted to use the real Mesa Boogie. Um, so I know that when I recorded the song the first time, I was in a different room in a different apartment, and I really didn't like the sound that I got. So basically what's happening there is it sounds okay. It sound, it's a good sound, but when I started to EQ the stuff later on, I started to kind of feel like, you know, I'm EQing too much and I started putting like revival and stuff on it. And that's when I just kind of went like, look, I'm, I'm making too many moves. And I think I actually had like some problem frequencies and I was using a de to try to squash some of them. So to me, what that says is that I eventually decided I wasn't happy um, with the recorded guitar sound and decided to start over again. So this is uh, my 1992, I think it was 19, 1992 Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier Revision F. So it's one of the old fucking rectifiers, man, it's sitting right over here next to me. And that thing... Uh, that's also what you'll mostly hear me playing like on my YouTube channel where I, you know, play some of the songs live. I actually mic up the guitar cab and kind of have fun with that thing. But, uh, I can't remember what I recorded with. I, I'm pretty sure I used all the same equipment, but I just maybe just didn't like the way I, I set it up. So most likely it was my revision F dual rectifier run through a 112 orange cab, which is... I fucking love that thing. I have a, I have a 412 oversized Mesa uh, cab from 1998. And I also have a little orange 112 that I picked up uh, from like Guitar Center back in like 2014, 15. I don't know. Pretty new cab. But that little cab just sounds really good when you mic it up because it's smaller. The way that it kind of doesn't let all that low end. You really don't need a lot of that low end in the guitar tone. The the bass and everything kind of takes care of that. And I really do push the low end chug on some of my stuff. Um, like if you listen to like Solar Flame in the car, <laughs> at least in my car, when the fucking guitar chugs, you fucking know it. And that might be a, you know a little bit of a faux pas for some people, but I don't care. I like the chug. I do things because I like the way it sounds, not because somebody else does or whatever. So. Um, so I went back and I redid the guitars 
And I see on this track for these guitars, uh, I probably was thinking with my head on straight and I actually sent all the guitars to a bus and then just EQ'd them and did everything together all at one fucking time. So this is its probably a different guitar too. Yeah, that's much more of like a representation of what I wanted it to sound like. So you can hear how much I'm actually really taking a lot out of the guitars. Probably because they were fighting with the bass too much or something, you know, there's probably some kind of a situation where it was just like, oh, like uh, the final guitars and metal mixes often sound a lot thinner than they, you know, than, than you would think because the mix sounds so heavy and so big, but a lot of it is, is things working together. Yeah, see with the EQ off. It's a little... Yeah, it was like a little much. You need a little bit of room in the mix. Uh, another qu another question I'm just getting now is uh, those guitars are tuned to a drop B, so that's B F sharp B E G sharp C sharp or C sharp G sharp G sharp C sharp I think. Um, anyway, yeah, it's basically drop D tuning, but like just tune it all the way down to the low string is B, and then tune everything down with it. Um, pretty fucking uh, difficult thing to do if you don't have the right strings. I think I'm using like 11 to uh, 50 something. I don't even know what the top string is. I don't, I've, I've, no, I've never really kept up with like knowing what my gauges are. I just know which pack I buy. Uh, but it's the, uh, the 11 gauge, uh, DDT drop down tuning set, um, from DR strings. Um, uh, maybe someday they'll send me a box. That would be great. Cause I still pay for them just like everybody else. And the guitars are just a little compressed, just tiny little bit compressed. Uh, only, only when the chugs happen. So it just kind of, it's really just kind of taming the 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 low end of those the guitar chugs, so that everything kind of stays a little more controlled. And then I put a trimmer at the end, just in case I needed to adjust the the volume. My gain staging is I usually I'm not sure how much I was sticking to this back then. But I generally try to actually gain stage everything so that uh, the instrument level that you're seeing on the fader hits about minus 18 dB uh, with the fader at zero for most stuff. Uh, kick drums and snares usually hit a little higher because uh, maybe I want those to hit like around like uh, 10 or 5 dB on the stereo bus, so that way usually around minus 10 dB is where you're going to want to hit so that you have room to, to do all of your mastering stuff later. You don't want to fuck with your dynamics you don't want to crush everything and, and fuck it off um, so that later when you try to go and master things, this is a fucking mess. You need the dynamics and you need to be able to like listen to your mix without all the mastering stuff on it and have it still sound good. And case in point, this is not a mastered track that we're listening to. Uh, I actually, when I did this album, um, I ran it through a little, little bit of like stereo bus sweetening and we'll, I'll get into this a little bit later. But just a little bus compression, which if I was mixing on like an SSL console or something, I would have that bus compressor on while I mix. Uh, but yeah, by the time I'm done with it, you know, I, I would just I would just bounced out the fucking tracks from here. And then I mastered everything in a session together 
these days I usually just throw ozone on the fucking thing and just go from there. Cause I generally know how I want it to sound. Um, is it a myth? You shouldn't compress distorted guitars. Uh, no, because if they're like, if, if there's low end chugs and the low end is a little crazy, that's usually what'll stick out the most is just the low end chugs. And that's something that I remember reading in a magazine. I think it was, um, <clears throat> it was Wayne static of static X who talked about how he recorded his guitar tones. It's something that I always did for chuggy stuff. And you only want it to, uh, you only want your compressor to work on the track when the low end hits, you don't want it to like, if you're just holding open chords or playing leads or something like that, you never ever want that thing to start clamping down on that. There's no point in compressing that information because once your guitars become so compressed, so distorted, distortion is compression. So you're not going to need to fuck with the dynamics of something that really just doesn't have dynamics, but sometimes just a little peak control, uh, for the, uh, the low end and uh, a limiter would do, perfectly well for that same thing but just you need something to kind of control the the absolute uh, <clears throat> low end peaks that come out when you're chugging like that so those got the same kind of treatment with those little stops i actually just you know i played through the thing uh, and then I just cut all the little stops. I just cut them myself, uh, in the session by hand so that they come out like that. And I think here at the end, that little breakdown section, which I think sounds really cool. It was kind of an accidental thing. Cause like when I cut the bass, um, and I cut the guitars the same way and it just fucking sounded cool together. So... Um, which bass did I use to record this? Uh, I actually used the cheapest five string LTD bass that ESP makes the, um, B 55 and it was an older B 55 even. Um, I still use it. It still just sounds fucking really good. Um, and I think I got it for <laughs> nothing. Um, so I've got two bases that I typically use most of these days. You're going to hear either that same bass or you're going to hear uh, a Fender jazz aerodyne bass. So this is generally the way I think with uh, guitars. I want my main rhythm guitars. I want a left and a right. I don't want to have to put plugins on those fucking channels. You know, it, you know, obviously now I'm using neural DSP. So the only thing on my guitar track should be the neural DSP plugin. And I try to use the plugins to actually get the sound I want, not have to carve it out with a bunch of EQs and shit later. But sometimes they just need a little bit of help when you're in the mix later on in the, in the, in the game and something just there's, there's something just sticking out and you need an EQ and it's quicker just to throw an EQ on it. But I am sending these two guitars to their own guitar bus. And they are getting treated together as one stereo thing, not individual to mono things. If that, if that makes sense. It should make sense. If you're listening to me, that kind of stuff shouldn't, <laughs> that shouldn't be uh, hard to follow. Um, so let me see here. What else we got? Oh, we got a couple of um, we got a couple of like lead rhythm sounds and stuff. It looks like I edited a couple little things. Like maybe I didn't like the way I played one note or something and, and just punched it in. Um, <clears throat> I tend to want to move really fucking fast. And I, if I know I can play something from front to back, I'm not going to kill myself trying to do that for every single take. If I just like, I just don't like that one note. I'm going to punch it in. I'll just punch it in. I mean, if, if I didn't move fast, none of this shit would get done. And I hear so many bands talking about how they just can't get a record done. It's like, dude, shut the fuck up and get it done. Get the fucking thing done. That is the biggest thing I tell anybody. Everybody sits around wh whinging about um, trying to get perfect sounds and stuff. No. A fucking finished song is always going to be better than a fucking unfinished song. Just get it done. Um, so yeah, that was actually a sound. And you notice when I hit stop, there's no delay spillover because that was actually my pedals. 
um, plugged into my fucking amp. So. And it sounds like I wasn't even like recording in isolation. You can hear the fucking room. You can hear the track in the background. Yeah, that's a little old schoolish. I I actually am not like super anal about making sure everything's isolated because I think it's fun to hear a little shit in the background. I don't know. Rock and roll, man. Quick and dirty. Get that shit fucking done. Uh, so this little thing here is a fun little, little part. That is most certainly a guitar that has some effects going on, uh in the session so so it probably has that's probably a carbon copy delay and it's probably an EP booster pedal because uh, to get lead sounds out of my recto live and in the studio I like to throw like a clean booster in the effects loop so that way it kind of, it kind of shapes the tone it kind of gives it more of that brian may kind of vibe and that's how i did it and i see a couple of questions here so let me let me answer the questions um <clears throat> have i ever thought about side chaining guitars to my snare no i'm not really sure if i would want my guitar to dip out every time the snare would hit and especially in tacka 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 kind of parts maybe that would be too much i don't know maybe it's something to try uh, if, if you've tried it and you think it sounds cool, um, yeah, cool. I mean, I, I don't think that's something I've ever really gone for. Do I use custom IRs inside the plugin? No, I just use whatever the fuck neural DSP gives me. I've never thought to myself that I really, really, really just needed an IR. Um, I know a lot of guys like swear by their IRs if they have one that they really like and they just want to use it on everything. Um, to be honest with you, I'm a little disinterested in the IR thing. As long as it sounds good, then I'm going to go with it. It's fine. Uh, a lot of my, a lot of the way I work is just fine. You know, if it's fine, it's fuck. It's good. If it's good, it's good. Cool. If it's not good, fucking break it, throw it away, set it on fire. But I think the neural stuff just sounds great. Um, I think I uh, have a head rush gig board that I might use later on for live stuff. And it's got some IRs in it. It's pretty cool. Um, but uh, you know, I, 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 again, I haven't really messed with it, so I wouldn't know. I don't even really know where to get IRs. I guess you just buy them from websites and stuff. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, it, it's a jury. It's a Sturgis technique. Okay. Um, Yeah, I don't know that much about like a lot of stuff Joey Sturgis does, but I know he's he's fucking crazy immaculate. I'm 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 a little more like ham fisted with my approach. I'm I'm trying to be like the drummer, the bass player, the guitar player, the singer, the lead singer, the backing vocalist, and the, the producer and the editor and the I'm trying to do all of it like it because like by, by the time I'm done writing the song, it pretty much looks like this. There's not, I, by the time I get to the end of the recording and writing session, it usually kind of, it kind of already is close to what the final mix is going to be. I, I often don't even have to start back from a final mix perspective because I've probably been making the same mis- decisions just all over again. Um, who knows? Maybe someday that'll change. And a lot of times the reason I change things is just because of fucking simple boredom. So I've got two tracks of that same whammy guitar. That is a total whammy done with you know your hand it's a uh it's an i it's a 1997 ibanez rg 270 dx that my dad and i found on the wall out of a pawn shop for like 200 bucks in virginia and i was probably the only person in that whole fucking place that was like that's a cool guitar everybody else is probably like i don't know today that's great i'm looking out the old stony horny looking guitar with it's old devil horn sticking out of it i know man i ain't no banjo so i was like fuck it i'm buying this motherfucker and then like it cost us like a hundred dollars just to ship it back to California. But I fucking love that guitar. Um, it, because it's an old late nineties Ibanez RG, it fucking rules. 
and I put like Seymour Duncan pickups in it and it just it fucking sounds great. And it's got a little bit thicker neck. It doesn't have those little like wussy fucking super thin necks. I fucking hate that shit. I want a baseball bat for a neck is what I want. That's the way I like. I'll break these fucking new Ibanezes, which is why I play ESP now. Because those fucking things are goddamn weapons. You can beat somebody to death with one of those things. So anyway, uh, but for this album, I did use an RG with, it had a shitty old, you know, fucking floating Floyd Rose rip off tremolo and actually put a real OFR in it. And I was kind of all over the place with that thing. So here's like that two tracks for a harmony. And check this out when I hit stop. You hear that shimmer? That is literally shimmer. That is one of my favorite reverb plugins for like sound designy stuff. Um, Valhalla Shimmer from Valhalla DSP. And I think he sells all of his plugins for like 50 bucks a piece. Uh, really, really amazing plugins. I, I want to say that that guy used to make algorithms for like eventide processors back in the day or something like that. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I might be wrong, but I fucking love his plugins. He sells them really cheap. Um, he has vintage verb and Uber mod and you hear them all over my shit. And, um, I keep buying more of them as they come out and they're always like 50 bucks. There's, there's like one of them. It's like an echo for free. Uh, but that's what you're hearing here. It's kind of an octave reverb. You can hear that high end octave. It's just so fucking cool. It's so sound designy. You just put it on anything and it sounds amazing. So that's a little layer thing going on there. You got the distant synth, which is kind of giving us the transient information. So that's kind of, it's kind of mimicking itself. And then, uh, you know, of course it's got all these scapey things. Yeah, that's dreamy, trippy shit, man. All right. <clears throat> so what the fuck are we doing next? Let's take a look. Um, I think the only other thing in guitar land is just there's a lead later on. It's nothing special. Yeah, that's the one we already looked at anyway. So there's only like three little uh, pieces of guitar and one of them is copy pasted to where it, it happens twice in the song and that's it. And it follows the synths and live i could get away with only having one guitar player play like the harmony because it's going to harmonize with the synth and that's one of the reasons it's one of those kind of decisions i make in the studio thinking ahead of like well if we were going to play this live at some point i want it to be playable and still sound like this we got the guitars we got the bass we got the drums so up at this point we are talking about sprinkly stuff and we already kind of looked at the sense of the beginning of it but there's just a couple more things going on um before we get to the vocals. So we got a distorted. And that's going on during the, uh, during the chorus. I always like to kind of add some kind of a gritty synth thing that can live with, um, with the guitars, kind of. Everybody fattens each other up. Also, I'm not playing straight power chords. I typically like to add some kind of extra note to the chords, um, you know, on big sections like this chorus.
So that was one synth sound, and I think, let's see, what else do we have? Chorus lead. Yeah. Alright, so the distorted bass is actually a plugin that I also have not used since I wrote this song. <laughs> this is Steinberg's uh, Retrolog. Um, wow, God, I was using a lot of stock stuff back then and I didn't have to. Yeah, that's Retrolog too. It fucking sounds good, dude. It's like, that's kind of the thing is like, just, just use whatever the hell you have. You know, synthesizers kind of do a lot of the similar things um there's different types of synths so like i'm not gonna say the fm synth does the same thing like an analog subtractive synth does synth does but like generally if we're talking like analog synths or, or analog style digital synths then yeah they're probably gonna have sawtooths and sub oscillators and square waves and all that shit and then you 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 do envelopes on the filters and the vcas and all that stuff and then you you generally end up at the same kind of you know place um, certain things will have a tone to it. Um, you know, I really factor in, you know, when I'm trying to write a song, I will try to stick to like one thing. Like I want to write a song. I'm going to use all the sense. I just want to use my access virus C, or I just want to use a Waldorf Blofeld, or I just want to use the Arturia collection or even limited sense within the Arturia. Like I want to, I want to use only the Oberheim from Arturia unless it's unless it's like a contact library where like I, I need like a string section or something like all my synth sounds will come from either the same synth or it'll come from like a suite of synths that makes sense. Most of the stuff I did for Resodrone from the cyberpunk 2077 soundtrack, I used uh, a Roland Gaia and I just bought serum transfer X for X for serum. Yes. Crossfer. X for I don't fucking know, dude. Anyway, but that's what I was using for this one. That's all the synths. There's really not a lot of fucking synths in here, dude. Uh, they were really just synths in there just to to kind of exist and and let you know, hey, there, this is going to be a synthier metal ish album than most metal stuff. Christ for Christ for serum, yeah. Oh God. So, um. Now is the time when I pull my pants down in front of all of you on stream. Uh, we're at the vocals. And I'm, I'm going to solo these fucking vocals. And I'm going to look at what I did that I think I did well. And I'm going to look at things that I think I fucking should have done better. And who knows? I probably... I might even be a better singer now than I was back then. Ah, fuck if I know. So... Um, it looks like I have a vocal group going on and there's nothing on it but a VCC. I have some effects on the vocals that are uh, coming from effects tracks. Um, I might make different decisions. I might actually put more effects actually on the track itself rather than building a group just to do that or building a send just to do that. Uh, reverbs and delays. Yeah, it's going to be a send probably, but um, let's see. So I'm just going to start here. But the very first thing that we hear in the track, which is me just going, Ugh. um, let's have, let's have a listen. The blood stays and the colors fade under a sky of pain. A light shines on the withered remains of all the hopes and dreams as time drifts away. Yeah, so uh, that one just had a uh, noise gate. I guess, you know, the, the I was probably holding. Uh, definitely it was an SM7, a short SM7A, because it's, it's this same mic right here that I'm using to talk to you. Um, at the time, I was using a Golden Age Audio Pre-73, which is like a two or $300, you know, um, 1073 ripoff, like a Neve 1073 preamp into uh the 1176 side of a universal audio 6176 these days i'm just using the 6176 straight into the 610 side of the uh, the 610 preamp straight out to the 
1176 side because no other reason than my 1073 it's just fucking noisy and it drives me crazy and i'm just like ah it's like a it's even though it sounds like a 1073 sorta it's still a cheap ass preamp and i know my 610b is actually a better preamp so you know fucking i just yeah i just use that like just whatever it doesn't nobody wrote me a message or anything saying like hey did you use a different preamp <laughs> nobody ever fucking does man and that's the that's the other thing about music production nobody gives a fuck just make that shit sound good, you know, and that's all they care about. They don't even know why it sounds good anyway. Um, so it just made my life a little simpler, a little easier. And once I got through the gate, uh, I did a little EQing. Looks like I took out some boxiness. I took out uh, had a little bit of highs, boosted some lows, compressed it at four to one. Um, the blood. The blood stays and the colors. It's squashing it pretty good. It's like seven decibels of gain reduction on that motherfucker. And then I've got a little, just a couple of little really light EQ moves. It looks like I'm just cutting a little bit of four, four, four and a half, four point two nine 4.29 uh, kilohertz out, uh, boosting a little more around 10K ish, 9, 10K. Uh, but it looks like most of the tone shaping is happening on the revival. I guess it felt like I wanted it to have a little more of a harmonic saturation thing in the high and the lows rather than um, trying to EQ it in. EQing is typically a little cleaner sounding, but like sometimes I want like a saturated kind of harmonic thing to happen. And it's just like the highs are a little smoother and a little fuzzier and the lows are a little, a little, little, fu- little fluffy or puffier too. And I think it sounds a little bigger sometimes. And I've got a trimmer at the end that's not doing anything, but it, it it's nice. It's there if I needed it. And then, uh, Wow. Okay, so I would probably here's all my plugins. Um, if I was going to put something on my screaming vocals or even pop vocals, dude, like you got to do something. I would probably use something like the decapitator. Uh, here it is. I would probably use something like this instead of the quad quadra fuzz the steinberg quadra fuzz the blood stays and the colors fade under a sky of pain okay a light shines on the weather remains i made it i made it work i made it sound good but uh, i would use the decapitator and not not the quadra fuzz the blood stays and the colors fade under a sky of pain a light shines on the withered remains of all the hopes and dreams as time drifts away. I just think it's a better sounding saturator. Um, sorry, that takes it takes my voice out when I uh took stuff off. Discard. But I'm gonna stick to what I had on here from the very beginning. I don't want to deviate from. Police are coming for me right now. Uh, yeah, it, I totally like that fuzzy is way fucking better. It, it, the decapitator sounds better. If it's not decapitator, it'll be, um, oh God, I always forget the fucking names of the goddamn manufacturers. Uh, fab filter, fab filter. Saturn is another really, really good saturator. And I, I think it might actually be a little easier on the CPU. The blood stays and the colors fade. Under a sky of pain A light shines on the withered remains Of all the hopes and dreams as time The blood stays and the colors fade, colors fade. Under a sky of pain There's no, uh, no one would, would like, you know, call me out for using Quadrafuzz over Fab Filter once you sit it in the mix but I, you know, it, it, it just does sound better. Like you can't go wrong with decapitator or the fucking fab filter. It just sounds fucking great. I tend to find that decapitator sounds more gravelly and Saturn tends to be able to sound smoother. I would put that fucking Saturn plug in on a clean, uh, fucking country vocal. And, and it just, it adds a saturation to it. That's the, it, it doesn't make your ear go, Oh, that's distorted. It just adds information that makes the vocal filled in and it makes it sit in the mix in a way that like just EQ and compression just can't get it to just fill out like that. It's a really great plugin. They're all great plugins. Um, 
So I've got some backing vocals going on with this motherfucker the too. The blood stays and the colors fade. Colors fade under Ooh. a sky of pain. A sky of pain. A light shines on the withered remains of all the hopes and dreams as time drifts away. The blood stays and the colors fade. The colors fade. So here's a mistake that I made back in the day. This is something that I've definitely noticed happened um, that I didn't catch always, but I've actually got all of the, the, the vocals here are on mono tracks because I had gone from, I had gone from uh, Pro Tools and Logic and then I moved over to Cubase and Cubase handles stereo and um it handles like like stereo and, and mono tracks differently. So I was actually mixing a lot of tracks in mono that should have been in stereo, had stereo plugins on stuff. And then by the time I got to the mix, like for some reason, I just wasn't focused on the fact that it wasn't as wide as I thought it should have been. It still sounded good to me. So I just never went back and like fixed it. But like, yeah, there's a mistake right there. I've got like, uh, this is a stereo plugin, Valhalla Uber mod, and it's on a track that is mono. Uh, that same thing is happening here. But it doesn't make the sound. I actually kind of think that now that I'm sitting here looking back, I think that's actually the sound of this track with all the vocals kind of layered narrow in the middle is kind of what gives it the sound that it has. But, um, you know, the 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 sends to the effects and the reverb and stuff actually do keep it, give it a little more stereo. So um, let's take a look. Uh, I've got guitar rig. God, I have so many plugins on this fucking backing vocal. All right, so it's hitting. A, a, um, this is the Native Instruments. I think Soft Tube is the company. Think maybe that makes these. Yeah, Soft Tube says right there. Okay, Soft Tube uh, VC two A. This is basically an LA two A. Um, it's it's a good plugin. It does its job. I don't have a problem with it. Um, there's I, I think I've got some other LA two A type style plugins that I probably prefer. I can't think of them right now. I know that the opto in um, Steven Slate VMR just came out not too long ago. It's really, really good, but I guess I just wanted it to be just crushed like a wall. The blood stays and the colors fade. Colors fade and then a, a fucking DSer and then a tube screamer and then a fucking, <laughs> and then a, a stereo plugin that's actually only in mono. And then, uh, and then it hits the virtual mix rack, uh, virtual console. What the fuck I was thinking with that? Whatever. <laughs> Does it sound okay? Uh, let's 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 see. Does it sound good? A sky of pain. Hey, so far away. It still works. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, it's probably the reason I never fixed it because like, I guess it really kind of wasn't broken. It's going to take a million years to save right now. The blood stays and the colors fade. All right. So we're getting into the melodic vocal. Let's see what the fuck I did here. I'll okay, say, so I've got a noise gate. Cool. Whatever. Uh, isotope nectar. That's probably why my session is taking so fucking long to save and open and stuff. Um, there's definitely better ways to, to, to handle your, um, uh, handle your sessions. These are not as organized as my sessions now, but Hey, you know what? Requiem is a cool album. I got it done. And that's, that's more important than anything else. Like I keep saying people get all fucking nerdy about their plugins and shit. And then they forget to fucking write a goddamn song. Slay to infinity. I run from the world. Keep your divinity. So I've got a little octave harmony thing going on here in uh, Isotope Nectar, and it is completely mono down the middle. Sometimes I think that uh, like a like a uh, artificially generated harmony just adds like a cool vibe. Um, sounds different than uh, you know just like modern metal production. And it looks like I've got a double. Slay to infinity. I run from the world. Quadrafuzz. Keep your bunch divinity. of fucking 
EQ and compression, and then these guys boosting a whole bunch of high-end harmonics. Um, it looks like I had a VC2A and a DSer, and then decided I didn't need them, but I left them there if I <laughs> wanted to go back, I guess. Uh, Quadrafuzz doing his Quadrafuzz thing. Uh, there's Ubermod, the stereo plugin that's only working in mono. Keep your divinity. It's all just kind of building that that size of that wall. That's all it's doing. It's not really doing anything too incredibly special. Um, it it all just comes together. To infinity. Okay, there we go. On that one, there's a harmony. Keep your divinity. And on that one, you'll see there's a little bit of like hard tuning kind of thing going on. And that's probably because I wanted it to have a little bit more of that, like, roboticness. Yeah, because it definitely has more of, like, almost a robotic, low endy thing going on. And sometimes I think that works. Um... Low end vocals, low end harmonies can get really fucking squirrely if you're not just nailing the hell out of them. And sometimes it is better to just go ahead and throw the fucking towel in and maybe put a little tuning on it. Um, do I do that for my lead vocals? No. And if I do, you'll fucking know it. I'll abuse it because I think that unless it's being used as an effect, you really don't want to fucking have like all your shit like auto tune snapping in your leads. Harmonies. I think it's okay. I do like the sound of it when it happens. Um, but Cubase does allow you to just do little stuff like if your note's just slightly sh flat, you can just double click on it and you can open it up. See if it does it here. Maybe I didn't double. There we go. Yeah, so if you go into Cubase, you can actually look at the notes and stuff and it'll show you. Um, you, you, you can actually see where the line is, where my actual note is. But then like it's got all these little blocks and you can kind of grab them and move them up and down a little bit. And you can you can make it so that it's like super in tune. But like you could see like my notes are wavering around. It's pretty natural. Um, but uh, but, it, you know, sometimes if you just have like a fucking killer vocal performance and you're just like, ah, it was just slightly sharp. It fuck, just fix it, dude. Just fucking fix it. None of this isn't making any of us millionaires do. You know what I'm saying? Ah, and uh, let's take a look while we're doing this. Let's take a look at the sins. So the melodic uh, lead vocal is going to what is called? Let's see. Dark Hall. What is that? It is a Valhalla vintage verb. Slay to, 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 to. Slay to inf it's a nice, uh, pretty stereo hall. That's where the stereo imaging is actually coming from because it's definitely not coming from my accidentally created mono tracks. Um, still sounds fucking really good though, right? I mean, I, I just it, it sounds fine. I probably never would have noticed. And the other thing it's going into is uh, Valhalla Freaky Q, I think. Freak Echo, rather. And it looks like the uh, the chorus synth is actually sharing the same reverb as the lead vocal is. Fine. I mean, sometimes it's good when the lead things kind of occupy the same space. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. In that case, I think it does. Um, Harmony Vox are going to the uh, the echo as well. Uh, looks like those aren't going to the reverbs probably because the lead vocal is taking up enough of that space with that reverb. Everything just get. I don't want it to get like too fucking crazy gets na nasty and all you know kind of uh it, it smears out your like stereo and you have too much shit going on
Okay, that one actually recorded two tracks and panned them hard left and hard right. Don't waste your prayers on me! So that's uh, two like mid screams on the on the left and right, and then the main um, corpse grindery thing straight down the middle, and that's just the background track. Don't waste your prayers on me. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, and uh, as a singer, fucking learn how to stop singing on a fucking beat. I swear to God, people don't know when to stop. Like people know when the word starts in a song but they don't know like when the fuck it finishes. And a lot of times when I'm recording vocals, I'll have, um, you know, click track on or whatever. Don't waste your prayers on me. You know, like stop on a fucking beat. It makes it more musical. It makes everything sound better. And it's easier to do backing vocals. If at the end of your fucking backing vocal track, you don't hear like the last uh, consonant, all st- they're all stumbling over each other. Actually, if you're doing backing vocals, you cannot pronounce consonants and it'll still fucking sound really good. Actually, it will help it sound better if the only consonant like a like an S or a T or a D or whatever at the end of a word like uh, f- fucking I don't know. I can't think of where a shard. I don't fucking know, man. Like if you said fucking shard six different times at the end of it, you just have all these D's like st- all fucking stumbling over each other. It sounds like shit. Um. Just don't even pronounce it. Just, you know, for a backing vocal, it'll be shark or whatever. Shark. Here lies my hope. Here lies my fear. Here lies whispery shit. Here lies my fear. Yeah, uh, I like grabbed my balls and just crushed them to get that out. There's no secret to that. You just have to crush your fucking balls. But yeah, uh, more of the same, I think, probably. Um, yeah, gate, virtual mix rack, compressor, EQ, quadrifuzz. There's not a lot of shit going on. Uh, that's really just kind of, like, that's how I usually approach my vocals. I just... I think that now I just have better uh, plugins and I kind of just, I still keep it pretty fucking simple. You know, sometimes I get a little crazier with it. Sometimes I don't. Uh, And I think we are at the end of the song. And I just have the uh, stereo bus just fades out until it's gone. And it was taking my microphone feed with me, too. Uh, So that is that's pretty much it. That's Infinity Slave. But yeah, it was really great to talk to you guys. I'm glad that I was able to do this. I hope that we will do it again more in the future. Epsilon Zero. Peace the fuck out.